Hello, welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ, to our midweek Bible study. Thank you for being in our class. We are studying through the Bible in our class, and tonight we're on lesson number 30. And in this lesson, we're going to finish 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. Get your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel. We'll be covering chapters 21 through 24. And we'll also cover 1 Chronicles chapters 21 through 29, which will finish up those two books. So tonight, before we begin, let's go to God in prayer. Father, it's a wonderful thing to be able to study your Bible. Thank you so much for putting these rich texts in front of us so that we can delve deep and see the intentions and the teachings that you have for us to gather. We pray, Father, that it will make us better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, it's about a thousand years before Jesus was born. David is on the throne, and he is in full control of the United Kingdom. In chapter number 21 of 2 Samuel, this is not recorded in 1 Chronicles. Remember, we talked about how 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles overlap, and they do. And we're going to see that 2 Chronicles and first and second kings are going to overlap. But we saw in last week's section of scripture, when we studied Second Samuel in lesson number 29, that Second Samuel recorded a lot of incidents that the chronicler did not. And so tonight we begin with chapter 21 of Second Samuel that's not recorded in First Chronicles. And what happens in this chapter? A famine hits the land the land that David is king over. And he's so sad about it. The whole country's sad about it. This famine lasts for three years. David prays every year that the famine would go away. But then God reveals to him that there's a reason that he sent this famine on the land. He said it's because of what Saul did. Now remember, Saul's dead. Uh, Saul is no longer king. Saul was the first king of the Israelites. David now is the king. But God said, I'm, I'm sending this famine because of something Saul did. Well, what did Saul do? How he mistreated the Gibeonites. Those Gibeonites, he had uh, no reason to do what he did to those. And we've already looked at what happened during the days of Saul. But David comes to the Gibeonites and he says to the Gibeonites, Look, the reason God's revealed to me that the reason we're in this famine is because of what Saul did to you and your uh, traditional, your family. Uh, if you'll just tell us what we can do to make it right, then we believe that God will break this famine. He offered them reparation. Now, these Gibeonites did not want money. They could have asked for money, and David had the power to give it to them. They didn't ask for power. He could have put them in very prestigious and powerful positions, but that, that's not what they wanted. Here's what they asked for. Give us seven men from Saul's family, and we will hang them. We'll put them to death. And when we do that, that will be reparations enough. Well, you remember that Mephibosheth is one of the fellows that are in Saul's family. Mephibosheth, the crippled guy, is the grandson of Saul. But David said, I'm not going to give them Mephibosheth. I made a vow to Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan, whom I love very much, to take care of his family. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, I'm going to spare Mephibosheth. So what he did, he found two sons of Rizpah. Rizpah is one of Saul's wives. If you remember, you can look back in the, the story and find Rizpah and find that she had some sons by Saul. And so we got two of those sons from Rizpah. Now that's two of the seven. He still has to find five more, and he does. He gets five sons of Michael. Now you remember Michael. Michael is Saul's daughter, and it's the daughter 
that was given to David. It was his first wife, and, and he loved Michael, and Michael loved him. But when David went on a, the fugitive, he had to leave. Michael was given to somebody else. That somebody else's name was Adriel, A-D-R-I-E-L. And you remember that many years later, uh, David asked for Michael back. And, and that's exactly what they did. They give Michael back to David. And Adriel ran behind Michael. That's my wife. Get, don't want to give her back to David. But they looked at Adriel and said, you go home. This is for national security. And David got Michael back. But Michael had five sons from Adriel. And that makes the seven. The five plus two is the seven sons in the family of Saul because there two of them are his direct sons, Rizpah's two boys, and then two of, five of them are, are Saul's grandsons. And those seven men were given to the Gibeonites and they hanged them. David took their bodies along with the bodies of Saul and Jonathan that were killed in the battle there and, and buried them in the family cemetery. Also in chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, the Philistines attacked again. You know, there had been a thorn in David's side since the very beginning, since he killed the Philistine giant, Goliath. And David went out to fight. Now remember, this is many years later. David is growing old, but yet he went out to the battle himself and fought with his army. And the Bible says in this chapter that David waxed faint. That's what the King James Version says, the translation, that he waxed faint. Simply means he got tired. He was just weary. And one of the giants of the Philistines, which they still had those giants, Goliath was one of them, attacked David and was about to kill him and would have killed him. But Abishai, remember Abishai, Joab's brother, he intervened and he killed the giant and saved David's life. We also learn about in this chapter the, the giants that were the four brothers of Goliath. Now we've already discussed that in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, how that they overlap here. And, and these four giants were the four brothers of Goliath and that makes five of those brothers. And somebody suggests that David got the five stones out of the brook because he knew that there were five giants that he may have to kill. I don't necessarily believe that. It could be. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us one way or the other. But nonetheless, eventually David does, in fact, he and his men kill all five of those Philistine giants. Then we go to chapter 22 of 2 Samuel. And this also is not recorded in 1 Chronicles. David sings a song. Now we know that David writes many songs and sings. He sang for Saul when Saul had the evil spirit. He wrote many songs and we call them psalms. We have them recorded, many of them, in our book called the Psalms. And David sang this song. He said, the Lord is my rock, he's my fortress, and he's my deliverer. Listen to verse 4 of chapter 22. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Verse 50. Therefore, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. This whole chapter is David just singing a song that he wrote to give praise to God for delivering him and taking care of him and being his security, his rock for all these times. Then in chapter 23, now here, these events in this chapter are also recorded in 1 Chronicles. We see in verses 1 through 7, of chapter 23, 2 Samuel, that David gives his last words. David's getting old. 
He was 30 years old when he took the throne. He's going to be the king for uh, 40 years. So this puts him at 70 years old. So he's getting, he's getting old and, and he's getting weary and, and he's dying. We're going to see the death of David. But he gives some last words. And the last words of any person that is about to die on their deathbed is very important. And everybody wants that. And, and the Chronicles really record these last words of David. We'll see that shortly. But we see that also in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 7, these last words. In verse number 8, it begins the listing of David's mighty men. Now, we've already looked at those in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 when we went through the Bible. But here, we're going to see some more specific things that these mighty men did. One of them killed 800 men at one time. We thought that Samson did a real big thing by killing 1,000 men with that jawbone of a donkey, and he did. It was, it was a gift of God. Well, this man had a great gift. He was able to kill 800 men at one time. Then one of these mighty men uh, fought so hard in a battle one time, just going through and slaying the enemy, the Bible says that his hand clave to his sword. You couldn't get it out of his hand. It became part of his hand because he was using it to engage in battle. That's a mighty man. One of them, the Bible says, quote unquote, stayed the entire Philistine guard defending his post. The entire Philistine guard came up against him and he stayed them. He defended his post. Now that's a mighty man indeed. Now once David mentioned while he was engaged in setting up for a battle that he would sure love to have a drink, but not just any drink. Oh, he would love to have a drink from the well that is by the gate outside of Bethlehem. <laughs> well, three of these mighty men said, if my king wants it and my leader wants it, I'll go, we'll go get it. And they risked their lives and, and went through the battle, went through the armies and, and made it to Bethlehem. And they, and they drew that water out of that specific well that David mentioned. And, and they made their way back and brought it to David and said, you wanted a drink from that well, and sir, we have it for you. But David wouldn't drink that water. He realized that that was blood water. He could have got these men killed. He risked their lives. Uh, and so he took it and, and just refused to drink it. I, I just can't drink that. And, and he offered it to the Lord by pouring it out on the ground. And he might have learned a lesson. You better, if you're in power, your words matter. So you don't get up on national television or even a real quiet private conversation with those who follow you and just make comments just arbitrarily or off the cuff. Because if you do, they could have some serious consequences. And David realized that. We also see in this chapter another mighty man, and his name is Abishai. You remember Abishai. Joab's brother. We've seen him over and over and over again. He was one of David's mighty men, the Bible says, and he killed 300 men at one time. He was a powerful, mighty man, man indeed. There was another guy mentioned in this chapter uh, that killed two men that were lion-like. They were so powerful and strong, the Bible describes them as lion-like. And they killed those two guys, this, this one guy did. In fact, he actually killed a real lion, an actual lion, in the pit. So he was a strong man, and he also killed an Egyptian. And when he killed that Egyptian, he did it with that Egyptian's own sword, he, or own spear, I should say. He, he actually went and took the weapon away from the Egyptian and killed him with his own weapon. These are mighty men. In verse 39 of chapter 23, 2 Samuel, listing these mighty men and their accomplishments, we, we see Uriah, the Hittite, that David had murdered. He is, was one of those mighty men. In fact, there were 37 mighty men in all. 
Then we see chapter 24 of 2 Samuel. This is also recorded in the Chronicles. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it, it, this is recorded as is in 2 Samuel chapter 24. What happens in this chapter, David decides to number Israel and Judah. You remember, there's, there's some division. Israel is up north, Judah's down south, and there's always been a little tension. They're, they're united right now. There's 10 tribes of the 12 tribes up north and two tribes down south, Judah and Benjamin. And they're united, but they're still distinct. And David decided that he was going to number them, meaning he was going to take a census. Now, Joab, David's captain that's been guilty of murder on a couple of occasions. We've seen him and, and even uh, conspir conspired with David to murder Uriah the Hittite. He, he's not a, a very nice guy, but he, but he is a guy that's uh, able to go to war, do what David says, secure David's military might. But even he knew that this was a mistake. He begged David, don't do this. God's not going to like this if you number the people. But David insisted, and God was very upset with him. It took David nine months and 20 days to get that number in. And David was very sad that he had done it once the number come back. The Bible says in verse 10 that David's heart smote him. It broke his heart when, when the number came back and, and this was the actual number. And he said, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, in this that I have done, getting the census, doing this counting. And then he says, take away the servant or the iniquity of thy servant. He asked for forgiveness. Now, what was the sin? Why, why was it a sin to take a census? God even told uh, the folks to number the people. We have a book called Numbers where they actually numbered and took a census. But God didn't tell David to take this census or to number the people. Maybe it was David's pride and his arrogance. You know, look at what I've accomplished. Look at all the people that I have at my beckoning call. Maybe that was it. Or maybe I just want to be sure that I'm, I got enough strength. If, if the Philistines fight me or any other country, the Egyptians come up and fight me, that I, I've, I'm prepared and I got enough manpower, I got enough military might. Instead of trusting God to take care of him, he's trusting himself and, and his resources. Whatever it was, it was a sin. And God was upset about it. And David asked for forgiveness for doing it. Well, God wants to forgive him, uh, but he's got to punish. You know, God's a merciful God, for sure, but he's also a just God. He has to punish sin. So he sends, God does, sends Gad, the seer, S-E-E-R, also called the prophet, and he tells Gad to tell David something. He says, you tell David that I've got, I'm going to punish you for this sin, and I'm going to give you three choices. You pick one. Choice number one, you can have seven years of famine. Well, they know what famine is. They just spent three years in famine, and it certainly wasn't good, but it's devastating. The second choice, you can spend three months losing battles to your enemies. Whenever the Philistines attack, you're going to lose, and that's going to happen for three months. You can lose a lot of military, a lot of villages, a lot of people can be killed in a three-month period. Or you can spend three days with pestilence, a disease, a plague, a pandemic on, on your hands. You pick. Well, David told Gad, I don't know what to do. And he turned it over to God. He said, let God decide. Let him pick because the Lord's mercy is great. And I just believe that he'll be kinder on me than I could pick myself. Well, God did pick. He sent three days of pestilence and 70,000 people died in just three days. Now, the pestilence was, was killing folks and moving folks uh, during this time. And David had to offer a sacrifice to stop that pestilence. And so he goes over to a threshing floor 
And the Bible says here in chapter 24 of 2 Samuel that a man named A-R-A-U-N-A-H, and I can't pronounce that, uh, Arona, Arona owns this threshing floor. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 18, it tells us another name of that fellow. His name was Ornan. Ornan on that threshing floor. So I'm going to call him Ornan because I think that's a better pronunciation than I could do that other fellow. But Ornan on this threshing floor. And David come to him and said, Ornan, I want to buy your threshing floor so that I can make a sacrifice to God because of this pestilence that's coming against us, this plague that is hitting us and killing all these people. I'm going to sacrifice to God to stop the plague. And Ornan said, King David, you can have it. Uh, you don't have to buy it. In fact, not only can you have my threshing floor, you can have whatever you need to accomplish the sacrifice. Here's the materials, the wood, uh, here's the animals. Whatever you need, I'll just give it to you. But David said, no, Ornan, I, I'm going to buy that for the fair price because I'm not going to offer to God something that costs me nothing. And so they agreed upon a price David bought the threshing floor, he offered the sacrifice, and the plague stopped. That is a Pepsi. Remember Pepsi, P-E-P-S-I, a physical example portraying a spiritual intention. This threshing floor of Ornan, where the sacrifice was made to stop the plague, and it did is the very spot where Jesus was put on the cross and was offered as a sacrifice and it stopped the plague of sin. Of course, we still sin and we come short of the glory of God, but there's where our sin is forgiven us. Folks, God knew what he was going to do for, from the beginning and, and he knew that this would be a perfect way to show you and I that God can save mankind by putting Jesus on the cross. You offer that sacrifice, David, there at the floor of the threshing floor of Ornan, and I'll stop the plague. I offer you the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the very spot, and we'll stop the plague of sin in your life. You can be saved. Well, now this ends 2 Samuel, and it's an historical record, uh, 2 Samuel is, as well as the Chronicles is. But let's look at the last chapters of 1 Chronicles, and these chapters are not recorded in 2 Samuel, just like a lot of 2 Samuel's not recorded in the Chronicles, uh, a lot of it is, a lot of overlaps. But these last several chapters from chapter 22 through the rest of the Chronicles, the first Chronicles, is not recorded specifically in 2 Samuel. So let's see what they are. Beginning at chapter 22, so get your Bibles there, flip over to chapter 22 of First Chronicles. And David spends that chapter telling us about the materials. Uh, there's, he prepares all the materials that it's going to take to build the temple. You remember that David wanted to build a temple to God. He says, it's not right that I'm living in this beautiful house that Hiram, the king of Tyre, gave me the cedars, gave me the carpenters, he gave me the mason work, and built me this beautiful house, and I'm living in this beautiful house, and God, and the ark, is, is in a tent, a tabernacle. I want to build him a temple. I want to build him a big house. Well, God said, no, you can't but your offspring will. Your son's going to build me a house. Now, David at this point didn't know which son uh, when he was promised that, but, uh, but his son, he's, he's happy that his son's going to build him a temple. So he prepares all this um, material for the temple. But then he gives instruction to his son, Solomon. He chooses Solomon to be the son that's going to be in control of building a temple, and he does. We're, we're going to talk about Solomon's temple and one of the great wonders of the world, but he tells Solomon specifically about building that temple and how to do it and so forth. In chapter 23, 
David makes Solomon the king. Now, this is in 1 Chronicles, toward the end of the, the historical record in chapter 23. He, he says Solomon is king. Now, we're going to see in 1 Kings, when, when this is going to be next week, God willing, in our Bible class, that the transition from David to Solomon, there's going to be a little hiccup, and we're going to talk about that because one of the other brothers, uh, one of David's sons, wants to be king and believes he has the right to be king. So we'll see that transition a bit. But that's going to be in 1 Kings, at the very beginning of 1 Kings. In the Chronicles that we're looking at tonight, that's not mentioned. It just mentions that God made Solomon king, and he does. David also, in this chapter, reestablishes the Levites to serve in the temple. That's what God wanted originally. The Levites were to be the servants in the temple, and they were for you. So David says, when this temple is erected and built and it's beautiful, these are the Levites that's going to be in control and, and take care of that temple. In chapter 24, it's more reestablishment of the Levites. You have to remember that it's the family or the tribe of Levites. Levi's been gone, Levi has been gone for many years, and, and this is the family, the lineage, the tribe of Levi. So he reestablishes those names. And, you, and if you're interested in, in names and genealogy and that sort of thing, this is your resource to go to, chapter 23 and 24. But in chapter 25 of 1 Chronicles, he talks about the sons of Asaph, A-S-A-P-H. Asaph is a musician. He plays on musical instruments, and he does that in the temple. We learned in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 5 and 7, that Asaph was involved in transporting the ark to Jerusalem. And Asaph was the guy that played the musical instruments in the parade when the ark was being transported. And David did his uh, dance to the Lord. We, we, we see Asaph involved in that. Well, Asaph, a musician, his family is part of that musical talent that serves God. And we find in the Psalms, the family of Asaph is going to write 12 of the Psalms. You know, there's 150 Psalms in the Psalms, but David didn't write all of them. He wrote a lot of them, but he didn't write all of them. In fact, 12 of those songs were written by Asaph, the family there. You can find these in Psalm 73 through 89. So, from Psalm 73 to Psalm 89, when you read those psalms, remember, it's Asaph's psalms. And that is in book three of the psalms. Psalms, we'll see this when we get there, but psalm is divided into five books. Book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. And book three is Asaph's book. And he is going to have that as a contribution to our 150 psalms uh, in book three of those five books. David ordained uh, that family to lead the people in worship, but we're going to see that the Asaph's family is going to be recommissioned also in Nehemiah's time. Nehemiah's coming up soon in our study. And when Nehemiah uh, reestablishes the, the temple again, uh, we'll see that, how that all works out with Ezra and so forth, he, he recommissions the family of Asaph to, to take care of that part of the worship. We find that in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 44. We also find it in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 46 through 47. So just put that in the back of your hat, and we'll see that more when we study Nehemiah. Now chapter 26 of First Chronicles in verse 1, we see that the porters, that's the gatekeepers of the temple, they're appointed, uh, and they're Levites, to take care of that. In verse 20, 
we see that the treasurers of the temple are appointed. In verse 29, the officers and the judges were appointed to serve in the temple. But in chapter 27 of 1 Chronicles, captains and officers were appointed for the entire country. These people are going to be set in their particular offices for the whole kingdom over the 12 tribes of Israel. Chapter 28 of 1 Chronicles, David is going to address the country. Remember, this is the end of his life. He knows he's going to die. So he addresses the country. But in verse number 5 of chapter 28, he names Solomon to follow him as the king and build the temple. The temple is very important to David in his later years. He, he knows it's going to be built. He's had that promise. He's got the materials ready. He's picked the man Solomon to get it done. And he spends a lot of time in that endeavor thinking about it. And he tells the people, Solomon is the guy. Now again, we're going to see in 1 Kings next week, Lord willing, that there is a little bit of uh, hiccup in the transition, uh, but we're going to see how that plays out. But Solomon is, is named king uh, in 1 Kings, and he's named kings uh, right here in the Chronicles. In verse number 9, in fact, of chapter 28, he addresses Solomon directly, and he tells him to do well, and be sure you build that temple. It's very important to David. Chapter 29, the final chapter, David addresses the, the country again, and he addresses the country about the temple. It, it's, it's on his mind. It's on his heart. He wants that temple for God really, really bad. He's, and he's going to get it. He's going to be dead, but Solomon is going to build this temple. It's going to be a beautiful temple. In chapter 29, verse number 10, uh, he praises God, David does, for his protection, for his power that, that's that's protecting him and for God protecting the country, God uh, to be in a protection of Solomon's future. A lot of that's being done in this chapter. Verse 22, they make Solomon king, and they do. And we're going to see again, First Kings, some interesting uh, backstory to that. And then verse 26, David dies. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 26, David dies. He rules for 40 years total. Seven of those 40 years were in Hebron, you remember. And then he moved the capital to Jerusalem, where he ruled for 33 years. And then finally, in verse 29, let's read that together. And I'm reading from the King James Version. This is 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 29. Now the acts of David the king, first and last, that means beginning and the end, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, and in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer. Now, we know about Samuel, First and Second Samuel, we're studying that, and that's probably the record that he's talking about in this verse, uh, the book of Samuel, which, by the way, First and Second Samuel were combined at, at one time in the Hebrew Bible, but uh, as well as, and it connected with the kings too, you study a little deeper on that, how it was uh, laid out in the Hebrew Bible, but he said there's a book of Samuel. But there's also a book of Nathan. We remember Nathan. Nathan is a prophet of God, told David, thou art the man. So he was sent there. We know Gad, because Gad tonight was sent to David uh, and told him about those three choices he had for punishment. And they wrote books. So you could read about all that David did in the book of Samuel, the book of Nathan, and the book of Gad. We don't have a copy of the book of Nathan. Or at least it's not in our Bible, not in our canon of Scripture. Or the book of Gad. But they existed at one point. And so we've got to understand that there were writings out there. And just because it's not in our 
Holy Scriptures that God preserved for us, which is God breathed every word of it, uh, there were records that were out there beyond this. And, and the history of David is recorded in, in those records. I don't get bent out of shape when I hear about other recordings of historical records because it's natural that that would be the case. Uh, I, I still believe in my Bible, and I believe that it is the inspired Word of God. Just because he didn't choose to put Gad or, or, or Nathan in there doesn't mean that they're not, they didn't exist. They did exist, and they had records. So tonight, we finished our study of 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. Now remember, when we begin next week, there's going to be an overlapping of First and Second Kings that we're going to start in next week, Lord willing, with Second Chronicles. And those Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings overlapping is going to cover 400 years of history of God's people. I want to show you that we have been studying in the, the books of history. There are 12 of them. Uh, here are the sections of the Bible. Uh, if you can see that on your screen, there's five books of law, which we studied already. There's 12 books of history, and that's what we're in the middle of. We're going to see the five books of poetry. We're going to see the five major prophets and the 12 minor prophets. We're going to see the four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, the 14 letters of Paul, and, of course, the eight final letters, which some of those are called the prison or the pastoral epistles and all that, but we're going to call them the eight final letters. But uh, nonetheless, that is kind of how we're going to section out as we study the Bible. Let's zero in on the 12 books of history. Right there, there's a crop of that page I just showed you, the 12 books of history. We've already looked at Joshua and Judges and Ruth, and tonight we finish the first and second Samuel. Uh, we're going to be looking at first and second Kings, Lord willing, uh, and then there's first and second Chronicles. We finish first Chronicles, and we will be looking at second Chronicles. Following that, there's Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and we're going to, and that'll look at our 12 books of history. If you would like a uh, PDF a copy of this that I put together, this list, uh, contact me. Uh, let, let me know. I'd be happy to email it to you. Just get me your email address, and, and I will email that sheet of paper there that kind of gives you the, the how the Bible is kind of uh, sectioned off and how that we're in those 12 books of history. Really enjoyed tonight, and I hope that you're enjoying the study. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Let's go to God in prayer to close our class. Father, thank you so much that you have given us this opportunity to have this class that we can talk about your Bible. We thank you for this lesson tonight. I particularly thank you for the insight that you've given us that Jesus Christ is the cure for the plague of sin. That's just a great picture that you show, shared with us tonight and help me to take full advantage of the blood of Jesus, knowing that you didn't ask my permission to send Jesus, but you did it anyway. You just want me to be baptized into Christ and be washed in the blood and walk in the light. Father, help me to do that. Help us all to do that. Help us to see that sin is the disease and Jesus is the cure. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.